Welcome to the Lean Blog Podcast. Visit our website at www.leanblog.org. Now, here's your host, Mark Graben. Hi, this is Mark Graben. Welcome to episode 301 of the podcast. It's February 20th, 2018. This podcast is sponsored by Cardinal Health. Joining me again today is Joe Schwartz, my friend and co-author of our books, Healthcare Kaizen and the Executive Guide to Healthcare Kaizen. He also contributed a chapter to the book, Practicing Lean, and he's co-author of the book, Seeing David in the Stone. And today we're talking about the theme of champions of change, as I've been writing about for Cardinal Health. Uh, Joe was previously the guest in episodes 187 and 299. Recently, when he joined me, Joe talked about 10 years of Kaizen and continuous improvement at Franciscan and the evolution of their approach to lean and improvement over time. Joe is the administrative director of business transformation for Franciscan Health System in Indiana. And uh, I hope you enjoy this conversation. Joe will share thoughts about uh, how he defines a champion of change and examples of champions of change he's worked with in um, supply chain improvement initiatives. If you'd like to learn more and find links to the things I've mentioned here, you can go to leanblog.org slash 301. You know, I've been uh, writing a couple articles uh, that are sponsored by Cardinal Health on the theme of, of champions of change. You know, one of those articles um, shared some stories from um, from your work and Franciscan and your colleagues there. Um, but, you know, in a nutshell, I mean, what, what does the phrase champion of change mean to you? How would you define a champion of change? I was thinking back on some of those big changes we made, and it often came down to one or two people that stepped up. Um, I had a big effort in the emergency room, and, and uh, we changed everything ex- except the doctor processes. The doctors just, you know, as long as you change, nursing should change, but we shouldn't change. And uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. I spent a lot of time trying to convince them on a different, few different things. And um, um, we, I took a number of the physicians on a trip to another hospital system so they could see what they've done. And um, and the doctor, you, you met the doctor, um, Mark, um, but a really neat guy. Um, he turned to me on that trip and he said, Joe, you know, I really came along for the food. Um, <laughs> but he said, now that I've seen this in this other hospital system, I think I think it could work. And I said, well, if you think that, then I need you to help me convince your other doctors. And he said, I'll do that. And that was the pivoting point. I mean, from then on, um, we steadily engaged all the physicians in the ER, and some of them were pretty tough to engage. But um, this doctor uh, stepped up, and uh, that's a champion of change. He's potentially going to maybe go against some of his other fellow colleagues um, Mm. in their strong opinions, and he's going to have to challenge those strong opinions. and that's what I found. It's those people that see the vision. They kind of catch a glimpse of the vision and say, I think this could work. And they and I say, well, here's what would need to happen if that would work. And they step up and step into that and challenge their peers to convince them why we should be doing this. And it's those people that have made the real difference on project after project after project. Someone has to step up. Otherwise, it's not going to make it. Sometimes more than one person steps up, but often it's one person can make all the difference. Mm. And and sometimes that takes courage for someone to sort of go against the grain and and to be a leader, um, to to spark others to participate, right? Yes. And it has huge risks for them. And they're willing to step into that risk, uh, which I commend them. Yeah. Yeah, can can you think of an example of um, you know somebody who's been involved in supply chain work in your organization um, that that maybe would be a good example of a, a champion of change, you know, at whatever level of the organization that might be? 
Yeah, you, you mentioned that um, when we talked the other day, and I've been thinking about it, and started thinking back all the way to the the beginning of the, of the work with Franciscan. And uh, starting in 2005, I, I uh, had a project in our Lafayette facility on supply chain, <clears throat> and I remember at one point in that project, uh, we were considering doing color coding, and there was a, a nurse that kind of sat in the front row in the event, and she, I noticed she had color coded, she had color coded highlighters, and she was highlighting mm -hmm. all the all her notes. Mm -hmm. And so I turned to her and I said, "Hey, um, I see you like color coding. Would um, you be willing to think through a set of color codes for our supplies, so that you, you tell it to a nurse once and they get it?" And it's very obvious, and and uh, so she said sure, and she worked with her other nurses, and they came up with a color coding system, and it was good, and it was really obvious, um, like like urine urinary tract items were yellow, you know, it was it was um, that kind of color coding system. So we put it in place, and it worked really well, and that system is now sp spreading throughout our system slowly. But uh, spreading throughout her system, it was just uh, her name was Shelly Paddock, and I remember to to this day she was that champion that stepped stepped. I mean, I asked her to do something, but she stepped into it and did it, and did it really well, um, and it made a huge difference. Um, and then in that same project in 2005, we introduced two bin systems, and uh, um, that same nurse stepped in and and uh, said, I'll drive that. And she she drove it, and we piloted on one unit, and it worked really well. And then uh, I kind of left Lafayette and came back to Indianapolis and focused on India, and they assigned another guy to Lafayette in my role, Brian Hudson. He stepped mm -hmm. up and took that two-bin system and spread it throughout the hospitals in Lafayette. And then and in 2007, I brought it to Indianapolis, and I remember a champion of change in Indianapolis, uh, Pat Gillock Rowe. She was the manager of materials. She uh, she was kind of resistant at first, but um, she, she after she saw the benefit, the value of two bin, she was on board, and she, um, you know, she shifted. And so that's a champion of change, someone that can shift their perspective. That's not just stuck. In a way of thinking, they're they're willing to look at a different approach and try it because um, that's risky. Uh, someone willing to step out of their comfort zone and take a risk is a champion of change. And then we did it in two units at Indy, but then spreading it was a challenge. As spreading all these things, all these improvements are a huge challenge. It actually took um, four more years before that could be spread. I remember going through a cost justification exercise for the two bin system and we really couldn't cost justify it. Um, the, you know, it would lower inventory hold inventory levels. So our holding costs would be lower, but it was only when I calculated it out, it was only, we're going to do 10 more units. It was only $3,000 a year that it would save us. And it would cost us about three thousand dollars per nursing unit to put in two bin system because mm -hmm. you had to yeah. change the shelving, you had to change all the little bins, so that you had a, one bin behind another. Um, so, it, and then even when you considered outdated supplies and stockouts and the search time for nurses and even the uh, the supply tech, we needed less of a supply tech. Um, but it wasn't a whole person. It was just a partial. So it was one of those uh, wouldn't fall to the bottom line today. Someday down the road it might. Um, so it was really hard to cost justify. And at the time I was working for the COO who was a CPA. And he kind of looked at me after I pitched my proposal. And he said, Joe, I, I think you've got a, more important things to work on. <laughs> <laughs> but it was one of the – it's you know, two-bit system is – more robust. It's uh, more stable than what they had. They had a PAR level system. PAR level is a, stands for periodic automatic replenishment, replenishment, mm -hmm. and it's really the the max. You know, max min. It's really right. the max amount. And what they'd have is they'd have a supply person go up every day, and they were supposed to count 
every single supply item and every single unit and replenish up to the max every single day. Um, and at one point that was a good system, but over the years they uh, reduced staffing levels to the point where um, the, sta the stocking people were not counting. They were just eyeballing and glancing and mm -hmm. making best guesses yeah. on. So there would be more stock outs and the system was just wasn't as robust. So the two bin system would be a much more reliable system based on the fact that they weren't really doing the, the true counting and the true par. Um, but anyway, um, mm -hmm. so I kind of tabled it and, um, but I, I communicated to a number of people that if, if we get to the point where we ever do change these supply rooms, um, I think a two-bin system would be a better system. So Matt Pierce in Indianapolis had an opportunity when we were going to consolidate campuses. They were mm -hmm. going to redo all the supply rooms. So he, he approached me and said, Joe, I think the timing is now. And uh, he's now our director of nursing operations there. And he kind of just took it on to convert all the nursing ends to two-bin systems. And uh, one of the things he used was a, a little simulation, a little game they played that showed nurses the difference. The nurses had to, got to actually play this game with real supplies to show them the difference between par level system and a two bin system. And they could see the difference before they even um, had to make the change. Yeah. So they bought in. That really helped accelerate that. But Matt, Matt was that champion of change that said, you know, we can't, it's not a the most important, highest leverage thing to focus on, but it is really important practice to put in place. So I'll step up and I'll make sure it gets put in place throughout Indy. And now that system's being spread throughout our system. Are, are there, I mean, it sounds like, you know, in the story there, there were a lot of champions of change. Um, are, are there other, you know, another example, other champions of change who come to mind? Yeah. Um, picking up with the, uh, um, uh, supply chain um, thread. Um, when we did the project in 2005 in Lafayette, um, the materials manager, Mike Draper, um, after he kept calling me and asking me questions, we kept a dialogue going for a while. And he came out of manufacturing and, and uh, wanted to know how some of the manufacturing stuff as well as both you, Mark, and I, we came out of manufacturing. He had that kind of background. Mm -hmm. So he kept asking some of the stuff he'd seen in manufacturing, how does that apply to healthcare? And we bounced ideas back and forth. And uh, he was interested in pictolite systems and carousels, some of the stuff we'd seen in manufacturing that we really mm -hmm. hadn't, he hadn't seen in healthcare. And I, he asked a lot of questions about those. And we had this dialogue going back and forth for a few years. And what was interesting with Mike, he actually implemented a lot of the things we talked about. So he implemented a carousel, and you know, a carousel is a pretty expensive system. And uh, we talked about when you use it, when you don't use it, um, what you augment it with. You know, anytime you apply technology, it's not so much the technology, it's how you use the technology. Um, so we dialogued for quite a while, and he implemented a carousel system in Lafayette and a pick the light system, and he did it in a in a nice way where it wasn't totally reliant on the carousel. He had uh, fast moving shelves for the fast movers. The carousel was for the slower movers, um, and through that he reduced his inventory space. And he had a special need to reduce inventory space because they were moving into a new building that would have much less space and he'd have the inventory uh, all stored on hospital space, which is very expensive space. So he actually reduced his total inventory space by 400% and improved productivity by 400% by really thinking through how you would apply this technology in a healthcare setting to achieve certain uh, uh, goals. So, I just thought that was really impressive. That's a champion of change that goes above and beyond uh, the project you're working on, and he continued it um, and made a huge difference in his facility. So that's another one that comes to mind with with uh, supply chain. So yeah, it's it's interesting that story you tell. You know, makes me think. You know, sometimes change and 
innovation is born out of necessity. You know, somebody being in a situation and say, well, you know, we don't have enough space, so therefore we have to come up with something creative instead of adding more space. Um, you know, I'm curious, you know, what you've seen through Kaizen or other projects, you know, how often is, is change born out of necessity? Are there times when people are just inspired to find uh, a better way because of the, because of the challenge involved or because of the benefit to the organization? Do you have, do you have some thoughts on, on that, you know, kind of necessity being the mother of invention versus people just finding a, a better way because they want to or because they can. Yeah, I think we, we wrote about it in our book, but one of my pastors years ago taught me the two parents of, of uh, transformation are pain and possibility. So pain being ah. necessity. Yeah. <laughs> um, possibility is not necessarily necessity. It's what could we do? And Mike was clearly in that realm of possibilities. What could we do? How could we do it? You know, what if these were the constraints? How would you fit a system into a, an area like this? What would you do? So um, I, I think, unfortunately, most improvements come out of that pain uh, dimension. But really, if you can drive people to think about the possibilities, you actually get better, I think, better improvements. They're more creative. They're more positive. Um, they pull on a different part of someone's brain when you, you get them focused on what could be rather than what we have to do. It's what could we do instead of what do we have to do? Yeah. Yeah. I knew you had a phrase for that. I'm glad. <laughs> Thank you for remembering that um, pain and possibility. Um, because, yeah, I think sometimes the 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 risk with pain is if, you know, if the pain is too severe, it, it leads to fear and fear can get in the way of creativity. Um, so I think, I, I, you know, I've seen situations where leaders find a good balance. You know, I'm, I'm having a, a flashback now to, it was back to 1999 at Dell Computer. Um, you know, executives decided they were going to build a new factory and unlike the other factories, this one was going to have no materials warehouse. Now, go figure out how to make that work. <laughs> I mean, that was, you know, they created a situation where there was a lot of necessity. And, you know, thankfully, there was a team of people who had enough time to figure out um, how to make that work. So, I mean, it's, uh, you know, there was, there was necessity. And at the time, there were a lot of people who thought the, the leaders were, uh, were overreaching. You know, there were people who were pointing out uh, this seemed like an impossibility <laughs> instead of a possibility. But you know, they uh, you know they made it clear there was no going back, and uh, the team had to figure out a way. But you know, I think there's 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 times where um, you know if somebody sets an unrealistic goal. Um, I heard a story this week. I won't go into the details, but somebody had given an estimate on how long it was going to take. Um, to, to go through unit by unit, um, revamping some of the material systems. And, and the, uh, an executive said, well, I need you to do it in one fifth of the time. And unfortunately, they, you know, they, they couldn't figure out a way to do it in one fifth of the time. And the organization sort of ended up backing off. So it's, you know, maybe, maybe it's the, the art of it. The, um, the big, hairy, audacious goal can inspire people or sometimes it's just too audacious. Yeah, I agree. Sometimes it is too audacious, but I think it's our job as um, change agents to help people reframe. So <clears throat> if they can't think of possibilities within a certain frame, it's, it's our job to help them rethink it, look at, look at it from a different angle. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a quote, I can't think of it right now, but um, – what we end up with often is determined by how we what, how we look at it when we go into it. So I think if we can reframe our thinking when we start a new venture and think about it correctly, I think we can get farther into the possibilities realm than we could if we could look at it from just the um, you know do it in one fifth the time yeah. or space. 
Can, can you think of an example either, you know, through your work as a champion of change or with other champions of change that you've coached um, an example of helping somebody reframe a situation to make it seem more possible in a way that that helps them accomplish something? Uh, one comes to mind, but I'm sure if I think about it, there'll be a bunch more. But I remember yeah. in the ER work, um, the emergency room work, when I first got into it, um, um, we were trying to reduce the time and um, dramatically re reduce the time that our customers sit waiting in an ER. And when I first started pitching that, the um, caregivers thought if we reduce time, it's going to reduce quality. Mm. Um, so I had to reframe that into we're not – the goal is not to reduce time. It's to reduce all the unnecessary waiting time for our customers and, one, and not to do things uh, in a shorter – you know not to do things that take five minutes and two and a half minutes. It's just to cut out all the, the unnecessary wasteful delays in the process. And so when they had this new frame to look through, they s saw different possibilities than uh, they didn't before they were looking at the things they do. Mm. And when they looked at this, this other direction, they saw not what they were doing, but they saw the customer. I looked at the customer's perspective and all the waits and delays uh, they went through. Also in that emergency room work, at one point we were going to um, change how nurses practice. Before they would see a patient and carry through with that patient all the way to the end until they're either discharged or admitted. And with the nurses, we, we were going to break that up into – small bite-sized chunks. So we had a um, intake nurse do just the intake. Then we'd have a procedure nurse just do the procedures. And a number of the long-time nurses objected to that because it was not the nursing practice they were used to where they saw a patient all the way through. And so I had to reframe that um, into a, a different level of thinking. I asked them, basically, is it really important that a nurse – has that continuity, or could we assign that to the doctor? Would it be better to have the doctor have that continuity if we had to choose? And uh, of course, they would say, "Well, yeah, it's if we have to choose, it'd be better to have the doctor have that continuity um, throughout the process." So, uh, convince them that the doctor would have that continuity through the process, and they wouldn't necessarily need to. Um, most of the nurses accepted that reframing. Uh, had I think it was two or three nurses decide they didn't still like it um, and they would not work in this new process. They elected to work in the other processes that would – we had two processes in the ER. The ones that um, – um, the um, <laughs> walkie-talkies had mm -hmm. a fast-track kind of process and the patients that needed a bed would get a room. Um, so they elected to work just in those – part of the process where patients get a room the whole time, so which was which was fine. But I was able to reframe it for most of our nurses to where they accepted that and then they tested it and realized it was a better way of doing things. So I think we end up doing it a lot and it's a good practice to get into is helping people see a different perspective on things. And often I do that regularly, trying to look for different perspectives so I can see um, uh, perspectives of a lot of the people involved. So I know uh, questions, I can anticipate questions and approaches and, and whatnot. Right. Yeah, I think one other thing I've seen that can help is helping reframe things back to the patient perspective. You know, there are times when I think of working with teams and you're identifying how the work is being done or their inconsistencies or their opportunities. And, you know, within a team, somebody might say, hey, you know, I have a better way 
of doing whatever the work might be. I, I have a better way. And somebody else might say, well, you know, but meh, no, I like my way. It works for me. And, you know, I think there, there's sort of a gentle way of bringing up that. I mean, a more polite way of saying it's not all about you. Uh, you know, if, we think about, <laughs> um, if we think about the patient, which works best for the patient um, can can sometimes refocus people and say, well, yeah, you, you know, you're right. And, you know, and there's constructive ways of bringing that up of, of you know, kind of reminding people of, of the alignment or the agreement that, you know, patient care, patient safety, patient waiting times, things like that are a priority, kind of regaining that agreement and saying, OK, well, now, you know, how would you evaluate these different methods and, and and sort of trying to make it less about them giving up a way that works for them and more about them discovering and choosing to do things differently in a way that's, let's say, better for the patient. I, I agree. And I, the fortunate thing is in healthcare, most of our employees are uh, patient centric and patient focused, mm -hmm. and it doesn't take much to um, recenter them back on the patient and the customer. Uh, yeah. But sometimes you're, you're right. They, they, they get off and they forget why they got into healthcare, and it mm -hmm. uh, they get focused on themselves. So anytime you can do what you're talking about is is huge. Yeah, and I and I wouldn't fault the individuals for ending up in that situation. I, you know, I think a lot of times leaders, and I, this is one thing that's been great about what I've seen visiting a Franciscan is you know I think leaders do play a role in continually reinforcing. Um, values and, and mission. And, and I think a lot of times, you know, in, in other organizations, when, when people are just struggling to get by, um, if they're not getting the same type of support, if they're overworked, work is too difficult, they're not being engaged in Kaizen, I, I think it's understandable why people sort of retreat into that mode of, of saying or thinking, well, it works okay for me. Because um, you're right, you know, you know people in Healthcare, a lot of great people are sometimes in um, challenging circumstances. So I appreciate you bringing that up. But, well, Joe, um, you know, I, I really appreciate you taking time to share some reflections on, you know, 10 plus years of Kaizen, you know, not just, um, you know, where you started in central Indiana, but as, as it spread and broadened throughout um, the Franciscan health system. So thank you so much for um, sharing some of that today. Do you have a, a final thought that you might want to leave the listeners with? Oh, no, I, I'm just uh, grateful for you, Mark. Thanks for, um, it's always great to talk to you. And uh, I learned so much from you. Likewise. And I'm just so appreciative that you would include me on your call today. Well, thank you. And um, I hope we'll we'll be able to do another podcast. I know I'll definitely I'll, I'll talk to you and see you soon. But for the podcast listeners, let's uh, let, we'll do one again. Uh, I hope so. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for listening. This has been the Lean Blog Podcast. For lean news and commentary updated daily, visit www.leanblog.org. If you have any questions or comments about this podcast, email mark at leanpodcast at gmail.com.